Welcome back. Here in this video, we are stepping into the last part of the theoretical analysis in this chapter. Okay, we're going to talk about something called the factor price equalization. Believe it or not, you should already uh, understand this. Okay, uh, if you have a pretty good understanding of the um, Stoper Samuelson theory. Okay, this is a, a very easy extension we're going to make on the basis of that theory. Okay? So simply speaking, uh, we are trying to say that um, the factor price tends to be equalized across countries because of international trade. Okay? Now let's take a look at this. What we're going to do here is just logic reasoning on the change in relative price of factors. Okay? Uh, of course, this is because of the trade. Okay, so we're not gonna, you know, use more math or even graphs. Okay, and uh, a sim very simple supply and demand analysis should be uh, sufficient. All right. So uh, first of all, let's take a look at the pre-trade situation in home and foreign. Okay, the two economies. Remember, pre-trade here means uh, the two economies are isolated from each other. Okay. And we still have the assumptions we made before. So home is abandoned in uh, abandoned in labor, right? And um, then labor is priced relatively low because of its abundance, right? And uh, of course, relatively speaking, uh, capital is priced high because of its scarcity, okay? And um, in foreign, it will be the opposite. So labor is priced relatively high because of its scarcity, and capital is pr priced r uh, relatively low because of its abundance. Okay. Now, um, when these two economies start trading with each other, what we find is uh, post-trading home labor is priced higher. Now here, remember, higher means higher than the the uh, that in pre-trade situation in home. Okay, it doesn't mean it got to be higher than uh, that in foreign. Now, and, and it's going to be higher than um, itself in the previous situation, okay, or before trade. Um, this is because we said that you know uh, when they start trade, then home would export um, cloth, which is labor intensive, right? So uh, along with the expansion of the cloth sector, there's going to be a larger demand uh, for uh, cloth and of course a larger demand for labor, right? That pushes up uh, the labor price okay, or the wage. And uh, in home, capital is priced lower again than that um, before trade in home because of the smaller demand for food produced domestically. Remember, um, now uh, home would import more food from foreign, right? Because it's cheaper. So the smaller demand for food means the food industry shrinks, and of course, the capital would face a lower demand. So that creates, um, I'm sorry, that leads to a, a, a lower price relatively. Okay. Now, post-trading foreign uh, means the uh, labor is priced lower because of the smaller demand for cloth uh, produced domestically in foreign. Okay. So they just simply import from home. All right. So the cloth industry in foreign shrinks and its demand for labor goes down. Of course, the wage will go down as a result. And capital is priced higher because now they're exporting food, they need more capital. So a higher demand leads to a higher uh, capital uh, price or rental price. Okay. Now, putting together, you would find that you know labor used to be uh, dirt cheap in home. Now, because of trade, it's priced higher, right? Uh, in home, and labor 
used to be priced high in foreign before trade. Now, because of the trade, it will be priced lower. Okay, so you can imagine that you know at the beginning, um, the uh, wage in Hong is quite low, okay, and the wage in foreign is quite high. Now, because of the trade, the no wage in Hong increases, and the high wage in foreign decreases. Right? If this continues. Then eventually, the wage should be equal between these two economies, right? Similarly, for the rental price, uh, before trade, it used to be high in Hong and no in foreign, right? Now because of trade, uh, capital is priced lower, so that the high rental price in Hong goes down. And the low rental price in foreign goes up, and eventually they should meet with each other and be equal between the two economies, right? All right. So here、um, it's a summary of what we just discussed. Once again,、uh, the two economies, home and foreign, are in effect trading factors of production. Okay, this is super important.、Uh, the most important、uh, point we want to get across with the Hexroli model. Okay, now home exports its labor embed, embedded、um, in its labor-intensive export of cloth, and、uh, foreign exports its capital embedded.、Uh, Embodied、um, in its capital-intensive export of food. So when we look at the pattern of trade, it looks like you know home exports cloth and foreign exports food. However, the fundamental、um, reason for that pattern of trade is because home wants to export its labor, foreign wants to export its capital. Okay, but. In the realistic world, these factors of production, labor, and capital are usually difficult to move across the border, right? So, the then you know what we see is、uh, workers in Hong would just stay in Hong, but they produce something for foreign, right? In this case, would be cloth, and the capital. Uh, in foreign will stay there, okay. They're not going to travel across the border, but they produce food and、uh, export it to home, okay. All right.、Uh, the factor price equalization. Let's check out the empirical evidence.、It、might be a bit disappointing. Okay, are factor prices really equal across countries? All right. Now here is a very simple piece of、uh, empirical evidence about、uh, wage, okay, which is a、um, uh, price of labor, right? Now we're looking at the average hourly labor cost for workers、uh, in the largest auto manufacturing countries. Okay,、uh, the data is from 2015. Now several things、uh, we want to see here. Number one,、uh, we're looking at hourly wage. Okay, or labor cost, so um, that um, should include wage and some other compensation, okay, like a benefit、uh, package.、Um, hourly wage,、uh, that's how we measure labor cost, okay, because we have full-time versus uh, uh, part-time workers, right? So we cannot simply count number of heads; we have to count the、um, number of、uh, hours, okay. Working hours, and、uh, the second thing is here、uh, we narrowly focused upon the auto manufacturing、uh, countries because uh, again uh, we want to compare apples with apples. Okay,、um, sometimes you know if、um, two countries are producing、uh, totally different things, then、um, it's pointless to put them together and compare labor cost. Okay, now here you find that.、Um, Germany has the highest、uh, labor cost per hour, right? Twenty-six dollars twenty-five cents. Okay, so we already converted、um, everything into U.S. dollars, 
and U.S. comes as the second, $23.83. Okay, and it goes all the way down to, um, for example, Mexico, $3.29 per hour. India, $1.09 per hour. So you see a huge gap here in terms of the uh, auto manufacturing labor cost. Okay, they are not equal at all, right? So here again, we would like to challenge the theoretical conclusions we drew before. Why are the wages still not equal, right? So we, you know, already experienced this uh, wave of globalization, right? Uh, we see that you know um, the trade share in GDP uh, rose substantially, okay, across countries, regardless of the income level. Uh, but here we still see a huge gap in their um, wages. Okay, where did we go wrong in theory? Okay, I leave these two uh, questions for you guys to think about. Okay, and bring your thoughts to our uh, class. Okay, we can discuss these. Is that really because the theory is wrong, or probably because there's you know a slightly different way to interpret this? Uh, factor price equalization thing, or is that because something we discussed before, especially at the beginning of the chapter, uh, that might have some uh, implication here, okay, uh, for us to interpret this wide gap of the wage across countries. All right, so um, that's what we are uh, discussing here. Okay, uh, for this video. In, uh, in the next video, we're going to continue uh, discussing more empirical evidence about the Heckscher-Olin model.